everyone. Welcome to this week's Source Snack Break. I'm Brittany McLean. I'm the Director of Membership at Source. Today is Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. I'm joined by Natalie from Northwest Framing is with us here today, as you can see from her beautiful backdrop. Welcome, Natalie. Have you. Hello and hello. Perfect. Well, for those of you who haven't joined us before, I'll just give you a quick introduction of the webinar tool that we're using today. So um, you have been muted automatically, but you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a chat box. We'd love for you to do what Andrew's doing right there. Wave, um, let us know um, what you uh, have questions about as we go through the presentation. If there's any comments you have, questions, things you like. Um, we'd love to um, hear from you there, and we'll be keeping an eye on that chat as we go through the presentation today. Um, I'm really excited. Natalie's going to be sharing 10 things that framers like herself want designers to know, and I really, I'm, I'm, I've got my notes ready here to take my own, um, but you will also get a copy of this recording after the presentation. And if, again, if you have follow-up questions, we'll make sure we can connect you to Natalie if there's something that we don't get to on the presentation today. So Natalie, what I'm gonna do is um, I'll let you introduce yourself real quick. And I'm actually gonna pop off the, the camera and the screen because Natalie's gonna be talking and showing us some things. And I wanna make sure you guys get to see her full screen on the presentation. So I'll, I'll pop back on if there's questions, but Natalie, if you wanna start us off and introduce yourself and then jump right into it and we'll get going. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yes, my name is Natalie Bodette. I am the project manager here at Northwest Art and Framing. Um, we are, among other things, do um, commercial work, contract work as Northwest Framing. We also have 19 retail stores and we do internet fulfillment service as well. So um, I've been doing picture framing for on and off over 10 years and I'm also a photographer, so know both sides of that. Um, yeah, super excited to share all this stuff with you today. Um, so yes, 10 things that framers would love designers to know. Um, I think we're gonna start off with the art itself. Um, today I'm gonna be working off of this lovely piece. This is by Lauren Marks, um, beautiful artist based in Missouri. Um, the first thing is going to be about essentially paper sizes versus art sizes. This is something that we come across all the time in the industry. Um, people will order a piece of artwork, it gets in, and they're like, this is not the size that I expected it. Um, so your paper size is going to be the, the whole total size of everything that you're going to get, um, the whole object. Your art size is going to be a little bit smaller minus the, you know, if there's like a white bleed or something here. So for example, this piece is going to be a 19 by 25 piece of paper, but the art size is 18 by 24. Um, it is important to note because a lot of artists will actually sign these at the bottom. I know it's hard to see, sorry for my glossiness. So um, we can work off of all different kinds of sizes, um, but you're almost always gonna wanna base it off your, your designs off of your art size. Um, as far as licensing and getting things online go, um, just cause it's online doesn't mean you can necessarily purchase it or use it or reproduce it. Um, so if you ever have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Um, we do licensing and are really familiar with that whole process. Um, so I guess the next thing will be, um, how do we frame our art that we now bought? Um, I always tell people, look to your art for inspiration. Um, your artwork is gonna be your roadmap to tell you what kind of framing it wants. Um, if you have a piece of artwork that has sans serif font, really, really skinny lines, you're gonna wanna do something that's gonna have a little bit more of a minimalist frame. Um, and a really kind of basic, more modern, you know, white mat. That's generally a nice way to go. Now, say you have a piece of artwork that is really ornate or has calligraphy on it, um, you're gonna wanna do something that's gonna be a little bit more ornate, have some more fine details. Um, that, that frame is just gonna kind of tell the viewer what to look for in the artwork. So if you can work backwards, that's really useful. Um, the other thing I like to be mindful of is the scale of what of the subject that we're looking at. So for example, you know, you're viewing a map um, of, you know, Europe. It goes in a really big frame because you're viewing something that's huge. Say you're framing a photo of a really close-up of a tiny, tiny little mouse. It's nice to do something that's a little bit more tiny and minute that kind of matches your subject matter. Um, as far as frame sizing goes, that would be kind of the next thing that we'll want to talk about um, is there's different frame sizing. Um, you're going to have your image size, you'll have your glass size, and you'll have an outer dimension size. Um, your, your image size will be the size of either your mat opening that you put around your artwork or your artwork itself and how it will fit into your frame. Um, that is going to be 
Um, that will be your art size and essentially what you visually will see of your art. Your glass size will be either the, that will be the size that your glass is cut to, and that will be either the size of your outer dimensions of your mat or just the size of your piece of paper or other art medium. Your outside dimension will be all of that, including the width of your frame. Uh, we can work off of both measurement setups. Um, we generally work off of the inside of the frame here. Um, this is called your rabbit. It is generally about a quarter of an inch. It varies a little bit, but almost always a quarter of an inch. And you'll just also want to be mindful that that will get lost under artwork or image. Your image will potentially get lost underneath of that. So we just need to be mindful for that. Um, now that is for a traditional frame. We also frame canvases in float frames, and that measurement setup is actually based off of the outside dimension of your stretcher bar. So your art size, say you're framing something that's 24 by 30. Um, I think I up there for a minute. <laughs> your art size will be um, 24 by 36. Your outside dimensions then will be this space here in addition I think you're to back that. now. Sorry. One second. Yeah, I think we're now? good. I, I popped in to see, but I think we're okay. So thank you. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of how basic sizing works. Um, the next thing that is also wonderful to keep in mind is your map margins. Um, you know, I we always have people to come in and say, I want a piece of art. I want my map margins to be really skinny because I don't want to distract from my artwork. Um, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but that is actually more, having tight, tight map margins is actually more distracting than having large, large map margins. So that's why when you go into museums, you'll see four or five inch map margins. Um, that essentially just uh, portrays a, a view of like this piece being really, really important. Um, the other thing is that when you have really, really tight map margins, you start to create lines. So you'll start to create lines and you get this striping effect and your eye will naturally go to that instead of paying attention to your artwork. So um, always remember if you want to, you know, uh, portray importance, make big mark, have, make sure you have bigger map margins. Um, the next thing that we'll want to talk about is going to be our, our glass and our acrylic or as we call it glazing. Um, so there's two main types of glazing, glass and acrylic. I prefer to use acrylic if I can. Um, that's because acrylic is a lot lighter than glass. Um, you don't have to worry about it breaking. And it is best for metal or skinny frames because those have a tendency to have a little bit more of a, um, a warping that they can do and it keeps the glass from breaking. Um, glass or acrylic is also porous. So if you have artwork that will potentially outgas as it ages, like oil paintings or encaustic work, um, you can still put acrylic on top of it and it will allow those um, nasty kind of gases to go out into the environment and not damage your artwork. Um, that being said, uh, there are certain types of artwork that glass is best for. Um, for example, you have a piece of rice paper. Gla uh, a lot of acrylic will have static properties. So um, you don't want to have static pulling on your rice paper. It'll make it look bad. So you'll need to use something like glass to make it um, to make it, you know, kind of stay flat. Um, I will say that in, with acrylic, they do have non glare options. There's something called museum acrylic that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it is expensive, but it gives you all of that. And then you don't have to deal with you can see there's a little bit of glare here, but it's just super clear and it's going to take really good care of your artwork. Um, I love my museum glass. <laughs> um, I have a question real quick, Natalie. Um, just talking about both in talking about the mat sizes as well as like glass versus acrylic, you mentioned price point. Like how much range would you see in terms of mat sizing? Is there typically, you know, sort of a, an option for different people with working with different budgets? Like how much upfront, you know, do they have to kind of consider that and how much would that impact like the overall price point, do you think? And it I know that's hard. it's sort of a vague, a vague um, question there, and there's probably lots of different answers. But you know, for somebody who hasn't really priced out that before, could you mm -hmm. give a little bit of a guidance of things maybe to think about and how that might impact your absolutely, product? absolutely. Um, pricing obviously uh, varies incredibly across the board. Um, I would say the best kind of, um, you know, the best way to spend your money when you're framing things is I always suggest going with conservation clear acrylic. It's going to be a little bit more than regular acrylic, but it has UV protection on it, which is 
I, I will die on that hill of UV protection. <laughs> um, it's so, so important for your artwork. If you care enough to frame it, put some UV protection on it. Um, it as far as going up from like, say UV acrylic to museum acrylic, you're gonna probably do threefold the cost for museum acrylic. It's very expensive. Museum glass is going to be a little bit less expensive than museum acrylic, comparable to the conservation clear acrylic, have the, the um, UV protection as well as non-glare properties, um, but it will be glass. So there's that. Um, then you have conservation clear glass. It's going to be less than conservation clear acrylic. And then you'll have your regular glass and your regular acrylic at your very bottom line. Um, okay. So as far as pricing goes, when you do add matte margin, so you're going for a, you, most people start at a three inch matte margin. If you go from a three inch to a four inch matte margin, as long as you're under oversize, which is 32 by 40 or over, um, your price difference isn't going to be a lot. Um, and to me, it's worth it. Um, you know, depending on what you're framing, if it's a double matte, it could add $50. If it's a single matte, it could add $25. Again, it depends on your, your, the size of your piece. Um, but it doesn't change it too much. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, the same thing kind of goes with framing. A lot of times people are like, I want a little frame because I don't want to spend as much. Um, it's actually a lot of times right now, thinner frames are going to be a lot more expensive, especially on big pieces because you have to add additional stability to it. So yeah, got it. Did that kind yeah. of answer the question there? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And again, as we're going through, if you have other questions, let us know. But I'm going to pop back on so we can make you full screen again. But please, I know, and it's a lot of information that I'm kind of throwing around here. So always down to talk more about it. Um, yes. And so I guess, yeah, as the going on to the UV light, um, UV light is always going to deteriorate stuff. As I said, if you care enough to frame something, you should definitely put some UV protection on there. Um, regular glass and acrylic will have some UV protective properties, um, and that will last you anywhere from like a year to maybe two years or something where you, until you'll get some really noticeable fading, um, that you can't come back from. So like I said, I always say, if you can, if you can do something UV protected, please do. Um, TrueView is who we go through for a lot of those materials and their website is phenomenal to detail more. Um, when we share this, I'm also happy to uh, add that link in there. Um, once your piece is finished, then um, we want to kind of think about the type of hanging hardware that goes on the back of it. Um, there's a lot of different types that have different applications, um, but one of my favorite ones that's new that I love talking about are these things, and they are called beehive hangers. Let me get it up in front of the black so you can kind of see it. Um, and these are really great for gallery walls because they have a tiny, tiny little bump on here so you can put it on your frame it'll go on your frame on the back like this and then you can go to your wall and push it on the wall and it'll make a tiny little dent in your wall and then the hanging hardware is this tiny little piece here and you can um and then this you can hammer right into that little hole and your picture will be exactly where you want it to be phenomenal like revolutionized gallery walls for me <laughs> um, those are really, really great, like I said, for gallery walls and smaller pieces. Um, for larger pieces, we also have something that are called wall buddies, and these go in each corner of your frame. And when you put those in the wall, they have these little teeth, so you can kind of walk it up. If the When you first put your hooks in, it wasn't exactly where you wanted. Um, these are really great. They come in a couple different sizes. We also have your traditional, you know, these are your D-rings little D rings that come in different sizes. And um, we can do those with wire or without wire. Uh, when you are doing wire, you wanna do it, depending on the aspect ratio, about a third of the way down from the front, because you do, when your frame is on the wall, you do want it to kind of tip off a little bit. Um, that allows airflow to go behind your artwork. Um, it also kind of tips it down, so you're viewing it at the optimal point and it keeps um, bugs and critters from making homes behind your frames. That's I'm sure you've seen. <laughs> um, for larger pieces, we like to use these three hole strap hangers, they're called. And these are really nice um, to put on canvases on two sides because canvases are really light, um, but you don't wanna put a wire on them a lot of times because it can actually cause them to warp over time. Um, so these are really wonderful for, for large canvases and things like that. Um, and then we also have what is called security hardware. 
for if you want something to be on a wall permanently or semi-permanently and you don't want it to, um, you don't want somebody to be able to take it off essentially. Um, and it is a combination of these interesting little things that go on the back of your frame. And then you're actually able to, you do two at the top, one at the bottom, and then you use this screw is attached to the wall. This is a key and you can actually lock it into place. Um, it's a really interesting thing. I know that probably didn't explain it super well, but um, they're, they're wonderful to use for, um, you know, hospitals, multifamily, things like that, where you don't want to be walk away with your artwork. Um, let me see here. Oh yeah. And then the other one that we have that I love is this is a, um, a French cleat or we call them Z bars. And it is one piece gets attached to the back of a frame and you can see there's a little bit of a notch. And then the other piece gets attached to the wall and it will lock into place and the weight of the piece will keep it against the wall, which is really nice. Um, it's really great for long panoramic pieces. It's also really nice if you're doing a gallery wall with really large pieces. Um, you can be very specific about where you place that. So um, let me see here. So the next thing that I love thinking about and sharing with designers is um, being mindful of your medium. We do a lot of digital printing and things like that. And um, we'll have customer designers bring us digital files that are not the highest quality and they want it to go really, really big. Um, in that case, I would suggest we print on canvas because canvas has a slight texture to it, which actually kind of hides any pixelation that you might be getting. So if you have an image, you want it to be really big, you only have a certain size file, um, I always suggest going with canvas because you can get a lot bigger without actually noticing that pixelation. So that's kind of a nice little, little trick that I've kind of come across. Um, we also do printing on metal um, through a dye sublimation process. And I love using chroma prints are what we call them. Um, I love using chroma prints in really humid areas like spas or in kitchen areas that are have the potential to get mess um, because you can just clean them really easily. I have them in my bathrooms at my house. Um, the other great things that they're useful for is you can actually print calendars on them and write on them with whiteboard. So they're really great for offices as well. Um, yeah, I like the dye sublimation process as well because it is, um, it's UV protected just because of the base of it. So dye sublimation, there will be a, a, a layer of aluminum. There is a layer of, for lack of a better word, emulsion. And then when we print on it, we use heat and pressure to actually embed the ink in that layer of emulsion. So most paper um, at you know a very, very fine level, the ink is sitting on top of it. So UV light is striking that directly. With chroma prints, it's actually not striking the ink directly. It's actually shielded from that by being in that layer of emulsion. So that's kind of nice because you don't have to worry about UV light with that either. Um, the other thing that I always love working with designers on is gallery walls. Um, we have a lot of times clients that are like, well, I have this really large space that I need to fill with. So I'm going to just order a really big piece of artwork. And sometimes that's great and it's exactly the look you're going for. But a lot of times that can be more complicated and um, a little bit more costly than doing a gallery wall if we're mindful about it. Um, so doing a gallery wall with a couple more ornate pieces with, you know, more on a frame and then also doing some intermixing shelving or other like objects framed. Um, by intermixing different mediums, you can create something really visually interesting um, that is also really cost effective. Um, so that's always something that I want to think about when design helping designers with those large spaces. Um, and then I guess my final thing is, is I always have clients that come to me and are like, you know, I don't even, I don't know if this is something that you can do, or if this is in your wheelhouse, I have an object or I have something that I want it to look like, but I've never seen it. If you can dream it, we can frame it. I have framed so many weird things <laughs> and for people and they were like, I just want something different and unique. Um, so, you know, we do mirrors um, and we'll do really interesting stacked mirrors, interesting shaped mirrors. Um, things like that are a really great thing to add to gallery walls, to open up your space, um, just uh, again, kind of create additional space in a tiny environment. Um, we also do a lot of object framing. So as you saw this vintage, this vintage tape measure, um, you know, we can do all kinds of framing and these are just regular frames. These aren't shadow box frames. Um, we just use them creatively and it's called like a base extension to create that whole space in there. Um, so like I said, if you have something 
we can frame it. We can get it up on your wall. Um, the other thing that I love working with is acrylic cases. Um, this is my personal piece. I'm a big Lebowski fan. Um, <laughs> and this is a piece of artwork, a piece of paper artwork that I had a custom made acrylic case made for it, cut a frame for it, and had a, ne had a neon pink shadow box walls. Um, so that's something that I just had custom made um, that we can also do. I've also done projects where we had a client that had um, floating on his wall. So we Am I back? <laughs> Looks like we lost you just at the end of the show. You were very cool. Uh, <laughs> about game, as I say, uh, is yep, that's my <laughs> all kinds of fun things. Um, yes, we've also done acrylic displays on the wall. Like I said, these African masks we did for a client that wanted them to float off the wall. Um, we built acrylic pedestals attached it to a clear acrylic backing and then um, made specialty custom um, hanging set up essentially. So these African masks could be hung on his wall and they're just floating. Um, so that was something that, you know, completely sketched out ourselves and had made, but is totally doable. Um, we also have a lot of really unique frames. You know, we have our traditional vendors that we work with. We also work with a couple of vendors, for example, that make frames out of like leather. Um, so this is House of Mercier. They're actually based in, um, I believe he's based in Peru, and he does all of these handmade leather, hand stamped, and everything, and they can do anything custom. You have a, a brand that you want on there. They can make that. Um, we also have a company called Atomic Frames that makes these welded aluminum ones that are very, you know, interesting. They're powder coated. They come in all different colors. Um, I've also worked with this vendor in particular. Uh, for a client that wanted to make custom barn doors, you know, like barn doors in their house, um, where we made the, the outside of this. And then the inside was chroma prints that he was able to swap out when he wanted to change his decor. So it was really nifty. <laughs> um, we also work with a vendor that does these Prisma frames that are, um, they're essentially like acrylic and they can do custom colors. You name it with these. Um, they're phenomenal. So um yeah that was kind of the, the the gist of what i kind of had to go over um and then i wanted to open it up for questions yeah absolutely no this was super helpful and um natalie and i were already chatting about turning you know this information into a blog post and again including some visuals because i think there's just yeah there's so much to learn about framing and art but um you know for us northwest framing has been a, a great partner in, in helping us and really that I think that's kind of also what we want to let you know is that um, you can really start with a, a grand big idea and the team there can help you put it together. Or if you're really like, hey, I'm still in the brainstorming, you know, here's sort of our mood board. Like that's that's a good starting place, too. Um, you know, and I think this is super helpful. I don't see any questions that have come in. I am. I was fascinated when you mentioned um, about leaning it in terms of like keeping bugs and things is that is that been something that's a problem that like critters like to nest behind <laughs> I've never thought about that <laughs> um so i actually am trained in um completely archival framing which is is those standards are set by the library of congress um and so in order for something to be on your wall correctly it needs to lean off because um, bugs and especially like silverfish, they love eating artwork. They want in there. That's also the reason why most pieces will come with brown paper on the back. Most people just think it looks nice. That is actually to, um, that is actually to also keep insects out. So if you have really high end fine art, you don't want to use a metal frame because you're not able to put the brown paper on the back to keep critters out. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, there's, there's a lot of experience and stuff that's gone into, um, you know, figuring out why insects like bugs or like- I definitely had no idea that brown paper served a purpose other than maybe just, yeah. yeah just pretty. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's very cool. Well, great. Yeah, I definitely think um, we got we got another thumbs up on doing the blog post again, so we can include some more visuals and information, but I think this is a really great starting point. I don't see any other questions, but 
thank you everybody for joining. Like I said, you'll get a copy of this recording afterwards and it'll include information about how to um, reach out to Natalie and the team, or again, reach out to Source and we'll get you guys connected if you need help. But um, yeah, this was really great. Thank you so much for taking the time to snack with us today and we'll see you again soon next week. Awesome. Bye thank everyone. You so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye.